Good evening. I'm delighted to be able to uh, spend this time with you talking about high dynamic range. My name is Danny Peters. I'm Director of Creative Services for Snell Advanced Media. I live and work in Los Angeles and uh, the media centers there, just like they are here in London, are talking about high dynamic range and how we look at these new capabilities for the workflows in production and in post-production. So one of the questions we ask about high dynamic range, is it all about perception? From my perspective, it's about how we see the world, how we process images through our visual cortex. And depending on what research you read, that our eyes can see between 10 and 14 stops. And I would say that, that it's not like we capture in a still instance that whole range of photographic stops, it depends where we look and how long we look for. So I can come from a sunny uh, outdoor scenes into a darkened theater room, maybe in a movie theater, drop my phone underneath the seat in front, and bend down and my eyes will adjust to the darkness and I can find it and retrieve it. I'd argue that the human image processing or visual imagery uh, through our visual cortex is probably one of the most advanced environments in the world and we have been since we started capturing images trying to recreate reality in terms of how our eye sees the world through captured mediums. So if we look at how we've been capturing images through the history of time starting off in film, the medium itself, celluloid, which reacted, light reacting to uh, the silver in the film, we have many technologies over a hundred years in improving that as a recording medium. Moving right ahead and looking at how we capture digital images today, we've changed sensor sizes from being a third of an inch big to now over an inch big and uh, looking at some of the latest sensors to being uh, extremely wide in terms of the width, the amount of dynamic range and data that they can capture. If we look at the uh, Mysterium sensor there from the uh, RED camera, we can see that the 617 is indeed a very, very big sensor. So we can argue that we've been able to capture high dynamic range images for quite a while now. We're now looking at how we can process and display those in order to get the full impact of that recorded medium. When it comes to viewing images, again, we've progressed over the years. Everything from projecting black and white film through the changes in television, uh, black and white all the way to widescreen and color. And today we consume images on a variety of different displays, some fixed, some mobile. So in my lifetime, I said I've gone from viewing images like this to looking forward to viewing images like this. I actually own one of those, and it's not the virtual reality headset. But why do we do that? Because we want a more immersive visual experience when looking at recorded images. So before I go on, let's look at some definitions. We talk about UHD, and these are resolutions 3840, 2160, also referred to as Quad HD, or 21. 60p. 4K resolutions, and you know, I would refer that as 4096 or greater. Uh, generally, the 4K we're talking about there is used in digital cinema. Standard dynamic range, develop around CRTs, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, with contrast ratios of less than 1,000 to 1. And high dynamic range, Contrast ratios greater than 1,000 to 1, allowing white levels up to 1,000 nits and deeper black levels down to 0 0.01. And WCG, white color gamut, color spaces beyond Rec. 709 and DCI-P3. Examples are Rec. 2020 and ACES. So the CRTs. Really a lot of what we've been doing in television when we look at uh, the standard dynamic range and now moving into high dynamic range can be traced back to what we did with the cathode ray tube. 
the cathode ray tubes are inherently nonlinear, and this is due to the electrostatic interference. And by that, by doubling the voltage applied results in more than double the light produced. So on this graph here, we can see that where we are around about 50%, we can see the light output here. But we notice when we go up to 100%, it's more of a logarithmic increase. So doubling the amount of voltage produces more than double the light output. And this is quite convenient because it's the way our eyes work. And we'd argue that if CRTs didn't have these properties, then through engineering we would have had to invent it to make the images recorded and played back on CRTs feel natural. Looking at how we record images onto sensors today, they record it in a linear fashion. So the sensors produces a linear response. So double the number of photons produces double the signal to the sensor. And we often call this linear light or seen linear light. And it's very much how the RGB sensors work inside the camera and computer graphic files like EXR, the work there is also done entirely in this seen linear method. So if we were to look at uh, capturing onto a sensor today and kind of, kind of trace that into a CRT workflow, I've divided this into camera side and display side with just a, a little bit of SDI transport in the middle, then figure number one is the image that we capture. It's a linear light capture to the sensor. And then if we look at applying an optical electrical transfer function, really a TV gamma curve, that's what we're showing in uh, figure two. And then we connect that to the display via SDI number three. And really what we do is to invert that signal. So voltage is applied, and this produces approximately the same 2.2 gamma. And what we see on the display to the eye is what the sensor recorded. So even in the OLED TVs bought today, we emulate the behavior uh, in step four so that the images that we view don't look washed out or burnt out. When it comes to measuring brightness, we measure that in units called nits. Different televisions can have different brightness but a standard HDTV is always graded with a 100 nit reference white. Consumer TVs, uh, uh, they're changing, and we have them between 200 and 300 nits, but greater than that is also possible. And to match the brightness, they simply stretch the signal. The graph on the right-hand side shows two different televisions, one with the blue curve and one with the green curve. Now, on the one on the right, the blue curve has a brightness of about 100 nits, and the green monitor has 300 nits. Now, initially, the green monitor may appeal more because it looks brighter. But once our eyes adjust, if we were to look at the same image on both monitors, the images would look roughly the same. And that's because the contrast ratio hasn't changed. High dynamic range is different. So if we look at the curve on the right-hand side, the blue one, we have a similar 2.2 gamma curve. And in purple, we have applied the BBC NHK hybrid log curve. This is just one of the high dynamic range curves available. The difference here is the contrast ratio is greater. So if we look down here at 10%, here on the purple curve, it's closer to the line. 
and therefore the ratio between here and 100% is much greater than it is on the blue curves. There are many more steps and the ratio is more dramatic using the high dynamic range curve. Now, to take this through in workflow to displays, we need a little bit of metadata to tell the monitor, to tell the HDR monitor, which curve to use. And so we have done some modifications to HDMI 2.0 to add that metadata. So that, now it's HDMI 2.0A, and the same through as of the new Blu-rays, uh, 4Ks, have got that extra metadata to tell it to use this curve to reproduce the image on the display properly. So this is just one of the curves available. There's also the uh, Dolby uh, Vision, and if we use their curve, we'll have an even greater contrast ratio than the ones being shown here. And I think it's important also to talk about color spaces that we use in television and that we're moving towards greater color spaces with wider color gamuts as well as higher dynamic range. So, you know, for a long time we've been using in HD, uh, since 1990, uh, we've been using uh, Rec. 709. That's shown here, showing us the amount of colors that we can use, transmit, grade, and view on a high-definition television. When we talk about a wide color gamut, we're talking about color spaces bigger than Rec. 709. So here we can see the television color space in Rec. 709. We can see the P3 used by the Digital Cinema Initiative. But we now have greater color spaces. So Rec. 2020 is one of these wider gamut color spaces that includes all of the colors that we have in nature and artificial ones that we can create, like neon and LEDs. And also you can see here we've drawn ACES, which is a wider color space that encompasses all of those other color spaces. And of course, ACES is a color space designed by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So why are all of these important? Well, if we look at this SMPT chart here, we can see that spatial resolution on the side, we've changed that from UHD Phase 1 to UHD Phase 2. In UHD Phase 1, we can argue that we had more pixels, but we kept the dynamic range and the color space the same. Now that we have moved on in developments, we can look at dynamic range, as well as what we do with color spaces and wider color spaces. And, of course, temporal resolutions as well. And really what we'd say is that for this better quality of images and workflow from capture to display, we have more pixels, 4K and greater. We have more colors to describe those pixels with a wider color gamut. And we have much greater contrast ratios with high dynamic range. And when we put all of those together, Together, we get better quality images right throughout the capture to display workflow experience. I'd also say that if we were to remove any of those three, so if we were take, to take away high dynamic range or more pixels or wider color gamut, then we'd be making a compromise with the images that were captured in the way we're able to process them and display them. And as you start grading the high dynamic range images, there are a couple of considerations. You want to have an HDR monitor to look at those images, obviously, and you'll notice there's more detail in the image. And HDR can be graded 
in a way that it helps to tell the story. The displays can show a lot more information. We notice that we'll see defects a lot easier than we were able to before HDR captured images. If there are things like focus mistakes, they become much more apparent when we look at those images on HDR displays. On the Quantel Rio, we can process HDR images all the way up to 32-bit floating point. We'd recommend a minimum of 16-bit half float for processing when color grading and render rendering. And then there's the workflows. If it's captured and the first master is an HDR, it's a recommendation to do the HDR grade first and then do a separate color trim for other color spaces like Rec. 709. And of course, when we introduce uh, new technology into our professional workspace, we talk about standards. And so the ITU and SIMT uh, are looking at the standards that we have for HDR. SIMT with uh, 2084 has actually validated the perceptual quantization done by Dolby. And so we're looking at contrast performance greater than 100 nits. And of course, the electro-optical transfer functions must be necessary on the display side to view the content. And as we talk about uh, H.265 or HDR10, uh, and also the transfer curves done by the BBC and NHK and Dolby, we know that new curves are coming to the market and that new curves are needed for us to have a complete workflow. As I said earlier, we're able now with the Blu-ray 4Ks and with uh, HDMI 2.0a to have allowance for that metadata to transfer the information about which curve is needed for the content being sent to the display. And this is an industry-wide initiative. So we have all of these companies here have formed the Ultra HD Alliance. And the goal here is to look at the capture, processing, and distribution of content in HDR. In the States, where I live, we have a number of companies already delivering titles across streaming networks to the home. So Netflix, DirecTV, HBO, Microsoft, Hulu, Apple, all have titles that they can deliver to the home to HDR sets. So I think what I'll conclude by saying is that this is a new tool for us to tell stories with. It has been our ambition to recreate the world we see with our eyes every day. HDR, along with wide color gamut and with more pixels, hitting the senses allows us to capture a lot more of the natural world. And now that displays can show us high dynamic range images, we can reproduce the natural world more faithfully. But like with any new tool, we'll just in the initial stages of defining how we can use it creatively to tell the stories we want to tell. Thank you very much.